what you're telling me is that pavan kalyan does not have an ideology but to gain power and the book or all the ideology that is espoused on the website of the janasena party is a means towards an end which is eventually getting power it is political opportunism played with such fervor and zeal that you think it is a ideological he makes a very startling um it gives very startling statements that will shake you and and uh, then uh, creates a kind of social chaos and from that he takes advantage of that and and he, he makes political and social capital from it he's wooing the bjp top brass like he woos a girl uh, so it's all attempt to impress the hindi speaking people hello and welcome to the wire as the tirupati laddu controversy rages on deputy chief minister of andhra pradesh and nda ally pavan kalyan has escalated it to a new level he is attacking apparently secularists pseudo secularists and also progressives for their indifference to sanatan dharma and also for ignoring criminal attempts to destroy hinduism kalyan is also calling for a sanatana dharma parirakshana board at the national level in fact one can notice a concerted attempt in the right wing ecosystem on social media to brand him a savior of hinduism and sanatan dharma in this context we ask what is pavan kalyan's end game here and what will his embrace of hindutva bear any fruits electorally joining us is raju ravitej former janasena party founding general secretary and someone who has worked very closely with mr kalyan even before the inception of the party he has also co-authored a book called ism with mr kalyan which lays out the ideology of the janasena party he left the party in december 2019 and is no longer associated with the party or active in electoral politics mr raviteja in the book ism pavan kalyan wrote a chapter titled my quest for an ideology let me begin by asking what is pavan kalyan's end game in his so called quest for an ideology uh his his end game is power and yes like all totalitarian uh, people like authoritarian people all of them who wish to enjoy tremendous power which has become the order of the day anyway uh, all over the world we see that so he has the same tendencies and the same objectives the ideology is merely an instrument in order to get to uh, great power over society and be able to um drive uh, whatever one wants in into the society and control it's it's narcissistic it's totalitarian it's authoritarianism which goes against the uh, norms of democracy or equality and, and those other norms so it is um, the the quest is for uh, you can say tremendous amount of power and control over society all kinds of control and nothing better than to acquire it through state power you see state power is uh, state power gives you a grip over the entire society entire country and it gives you also a legitimacy so you can commit uh, atrocities uh, legally so to say so quest the end game or the quest for power and ideology is merely an instrument the reason i ask this question is because it is not an ordinary day affair that anybody who starts a political party releases a book on what their purported ideology is and of course the logic of politics is that everybody wants to do good but if you have power you can do more good so i don't think it is unique that pavan kalyan is after power i think most politicians want power so that you know they have some ideas of how they want to organize society and so on and so forth whatever values they believe in so how is how is pavan kalyan's quest for for power different from you know, other politicians who are also looking for power uh he has like all authoritarian people he has a, a desire for power 
which uh, brings in a kind of uh, a monistic or monolithic idea of the society. So, for example, you are right now you are wearing a, a checked shirt, and I'm wearing a, a jacket and a tie. Now this is what I like and that's what you like and we can coexist with it. But if I tell you, you must also wear a tie and jacket along with me in the same way. And if not, I'm going to punish you socially. Then I want to have power over you. And then I then it will extend to what you eat. Then it will extend to your hair color. Then it will extend to your beliefs, how you worship, whether you worship, what you worship what you eat, what you wear, how you conduct your life, uh, personal life, wife, children. And so a monolithic idea, a monistic idea generally encompasses all of life. So all people who have uh, exercised tremendous control, individuals exercising tremendous control, have desired that kind of power. It's a kind of sinful nature that is there in all human beings, wanting to control another person. So, your your question was, how is it different from others? There is no difference. It's probably the degree to which he will succeed or he wants to succeed, <coughs> the passion with which he pursues it. He's a young, charismatic man. So, uh, therefore, he will have greater success. We see that uh, as a trend in the world, all over the world now. More than a trend, it's the ushering of a new age of authoritarianism. Everywhere in the world, you see rise of, say, someone like Trump. Uh, or uh, Putin, or uh, wherever you see. And also you see in India itself, you see. So this is the same. Uh, he, he is uh, probably a representation or a manifestation of the same thing that people all over the world are moving towards at the moment. <laughs> okay. See, uh, many considered Pawan Kalyan's public antiques and, you know, some of the rhetoric uh, very, very theatrical. See, uh, as someone who's observed him very, very uh, closely, uh, how much of this is, you think, is a deliberate tactic? And how much of it is just Pawan Kalyan being Pawan Kalyan? I don't think there is any clear distinction between he being himself and a deliberate uh, deliberateness of his uh, political actions. It is all deliberate. He, he, he thinks carefully about what he's saying, where he's saying, why he's saying. He's meticulous about it. He appears um, haphazard. He appears like he's uh, chaotic, but actually he's not. Uh, he, he has a, a good um, idea about what he wants and what he's trying to do. He knows. The, the, the fact that you think of him as a uh, uh, chaotic or seems to be, uh, you know, not in control is deliberate. That is deliberate. You understand what I'm saying? Th that is deliberate. That's how he wants you to think so that uh, you are forever guessing what he is. That's a, that's a power tactic. Has he always been like this? I think that's part of his nature. You're saying it's you, part of his nature. Even outside politics as well. Yeah, he, he's a man like that who wouldn't give you much information about who he is. Mm. And uh, if he gets to, if he feels that you are getting to know him, he will mm. try and surprise mm. you. So that you don't know him and you're forever guessing like you're a fish, like you're a fish on a hook, forever struggling, neither here nor there. So, and that is a power tactic. It is a, a power tactic of several narcissistic people mm. to surprise people and to, and to shake you up and terrorize you with uh, unpredictability. So let me get this straight. So what you're telling me is that Pawan Kalyan does not have an ideology but to gain power. And the book or all the ideology that is espoused on the website of the Janasena party is a means towards an end, which is eventually getting power. Is that, is that, is that what you're trying to say? If you see one of the ideals of Janasena party is Matala Prastavana Leni Rajakim. That means a, a politic 
a, a political activity or a political party uh, politics without even the mention of religious differences. That is one of the ideas. And right now he is uh, entirely is entirely focusing on religious differences because that suits him right now. So tomorrow, if another reality uh, comes to uh, take center stage in society, he will uh, choose that. So he has no ideological fidelity or integrity. He will choose whatever is advantageous at that moment. And right now, all over India, it is a very good, um, uh, you can say, I, it, it is very advantageous if you are a fundamental Hindu. You can get away with anything. You can make fiery speeches. You can uh, uh, you can speak responsibly if you are doing it all in the name of uh, Hindu religion. You can uh, get away with it. That's that's the situation we are in. So he's siding with it now. Hmm. In fact, I was just looking at. I just opened the website of the Janasena Party. Um, and one of the seven uh, you know, ideals that the party espouses is also uh, protection of our traditions and culture. How would you respond to somebody who makes an argument saying that Pavan Kalyan talking about Sanatan Dharma and protection of temples, Hindu temples, is part of their value that they've espoused, which is protection of traditions and cultures? How would you respond to this? Protection of tradition and culture is a very cleverly worded statement. You know, it's a very vague thing. You can apply to anything. You see, protection of tradition, of, uh, tradition and culture. You can you can actually attack me right now because I'm wearing a, a very Western attire, and you can say that I am a um, I have betrayed my own culture because I'm not wearing something Indian. Uh, but uh, these clothes are made in India, made by Indians, so purchased by an Indian with Indian Indian money. So. I can argue that, but you can easily say that, okay, no, 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 uh, that is a Western attack. So you can use it in any way. You see, there is no, um, you can make any kind of argument out of uh, a sentence like protection of tradition and culture. You can make any kind of argument out of that. It's a very clever politician sentence. So you're saying that it's largely just political opportunism rather than any strong belief in what Pavan Kalyan is speaking or saying right now? Yes. Or it is, for that. it is political opportunism played with such fervor and zeal that you think it is uh, ideological. I think that, that that's a uh, uh, that's where the surprise is, but I assure you, it is political opportunism, and okay. <coughs> it is something that gives expression to the radical evil nature that is in human being. I'm not just talking about Pawan Kalyan alone. Let's let's move beyond what Mr. Kalyan is declaring or what he's uh, written in the website or the book, uh, because those can be misleading, right? Those could be equivocating in themselves and one could make anything out of uh, yeah. some of these states as you mentioned uh, but as an observer i was i was listening to his speech yesterday uh, and uh, it seems like all of this rhetoric comes very naturally to mr kalyan right it's it's not like somebody was just taught this thing so the last one week and then he's just parroting you know there's there's a lot of rumor that the bjp is apparently just giving uh, him all the inputs and you know he being such a brilliant actor is just parroting all of this and acting it out. Uh, but it doesn't come across like that. I mean, it, it feels like he's very, very naturally, you know, uh, inclined towards what he's speaking. So I wanted to understand, uh, has he always held such communal and, uh, you know, divisive views? Or is this current ideological state, again, just mere political opportunism where he's just latching onto this? You know, can you give us some instances from his past, you know, which you have noticed? No, no. Uh, there is a very good side to him too. So I must say this or else it will look like he is a complete villain. So it is not that. And there are many times where he is uh, um, definitely not uh, uh, fissiparous or, uh, or communal or discriminating. In many ways he is opposite of that too. I have seen it in his personal life and in his friendships and uh, in his political life too. 
I was just going to so, ask you. I mean, if, if he's if he has so many redeeming qualities, and in personal life, you know, let's say he believes in the idea of secularism, why is he going after secularists or so-called pseudo secularists? Now, why is he doing all of this? Uh, he he might change it tomorrow morning. You see, uh, he might come and speak to you about the virtues of uh, Nehruvian economics and uh, and secularism and Ambedkar's great. Uh, idea um, he, he could do all that so uh, then then you will start thinking that maybe he's a uh, he's for the dalits and, and such things but right now he's leaning towards uh, or leaning he's completely immersed in hindutva ideology so ev everybody right now is is uh, uh, seeing him in that avatar that's all Definitely, yeah, that, that's pretty obvious for anybody who's noticing, right? The amount of world faces that Mr. Paman Kalyan does uh, has been doing, I think, over the last uh, 40 or 10 years since he's been in active politics. Uh, but what makes you think that he can get away with this? He gets away. He gets away because uh, of a couple of reasons. One is uh, he's a charismatic guy, so he will attract. He knows how to be attractive. And he knows right uh, what to say to be attractive to to the powers that be, to the person that matters at that moment. He knows how to align with powerful people and how to give them the impression that he is with them and he is their servant, in fact, and he is going to be the vehicle on which they can uh, travel and uh, and uh, fulfill their dreams. He he can make you feel that way. And he knows how that is exactly what a politician does. You know, uh, manipulation, uh, all kinds of um, deceit. And you, you can say charm, but with a deceitful intent. All that he knows how to do. So that's where he's able to succeed. Of course, he had tremendous uh, failures too. And he took them in his stride. And right now he's succeeding because he's aligned with the right political mix. Despite his frequent alliance shifts and ideological inconsistencies, right? Uh, what factors do you think contribute to Pawan Kalyan's enduring mass appeal in the Telugu states uh, and very recently in North India? We'll have to go over and beyond whatever your core group is and then build solidarity across castes and communities and religions and regions. Uh, I mean, well, oh, he, he's very, quite tenacious at following up on what he wants at the moment. He, he pursues it with uh, great tenacity. That's what is one of the features which other politicians don't do as much. So he follows up very, very tenaciously as to what he wants. He goes after it and he comes back again and again. He, he's the comeback kid, you can say, of, of the Andhra politics. Yes, he gets hit. He falls. He does himself and comes back again after some time. So he doesn't give up on that. He comes back and that kind of makes it consistent. But um, he's, uh, he, if you look at it, he's all alone. He, he has no team. He has no people around him. They keep coming and going, the people around him. And he doesn't give uh, an inch to anybody else. So he's dictatorial and therefore uh, only surrounded by yes men and the insignificant people. So. He just moves on, uh, uh, buys people's time and space and uh, uh, cooperation at the, for that moment, transactional. So no long term. But one, but one could make an argument that most politicians do this, right? I mean, they use people towards a means, as a means towards an end. And yeah, psychophancy is something that is a miasma that surrounds most polit politicians. So, I mean, how, how, how is it that, you know, we can say Pawan Kalyan is somehow unique when it comes to this aspect. He's not unique in that aspect. Mm -hmm. I'm not claiming that he's unique, but he is, uh, uh, in, in one sense, uh, he has a tremendous ability to come back. That's one. And he makes a very startling, um, gives very startling statements that will shake you and, and uh, then uh, creates a kind of social chaos and from that he takes advantage of that and, and he, he makes political and social capital from it. So right now what he's doing at the moment is also the same. But uh, there are other politicians who use different methods, that's all. And they will defeat him and 
it's, it's quite possible that he, he gets defeated and he keeps fighting. So it's just like a game. A lot of celebrities have entered politics and some of them have succeeded, some of them haven't succeeded. But from what you're telling me that there are people who admire Pawan Kalyan because of you know his startling statements or simply the celebrity good value that he brings in, the entertainment value that he brings in, right? Uh, but you're also telling us that not ne it's not necessary that this ad adoration that people have will necessarily translate into votes. You've yeah. been with the party uh, uh, until December 2019, which means that you must have you know, worked on uh, the party's campaign during the 2019 general election. What was your experience? And most importantly, can you tell us, tell our viewers, uh, what your assessment or what the party's assessment of what went wrong? Why this transfer of you know adoration into votes did not happen? Okay, in 2019, there was a debacle. And that was because he had no organization and uh, he had no support grassroots uh, at the grassroots. And the people did not have any confidence in his uh, ability to govern or provide them any kind of governance. So he could not win the confidence of people in uh, 2019 so that's plain and simple so you're saying in 2019 he didn't have the organization and largely because of that the tra the transfer or you know the transformation of this uh, admiration that people had for him as a film actor and somebody who wanted to do something for the good good for the society did not translate into actual votes if that were the case uh, what changed in 2024 apart from the tdp alliance that that was critical See, in 2019, he uh, went alone, Janasena was alone, <coughs> so there was a kind of a split of the vote. And in 2024, he very clearly, openly aligned, and that was a smart move, aligned with TDP. And then uh, there was a 19 incumbency uh, against the incumbent uh, Chief Minister Jagan Reddy. so they took advantage of that. and. Uh, so they did very well because uh, it was uh, uh, TDP's uh, in party infrastructure, grassroots uh, uh, activi activities and the members and the uh, active nature of TDP. TDP is a very strong party. You know? TDP has um, its members and, and its, uh, you can say, roots very deep in Andhra society. So he took advantage of that and uh, he did well in his little belt of... Uh, uh, 2021 seats that he contested and the rest of so the, the alignment was a difference that made all the difference so you're saying that just the alliance was the crucial factor but otherwise has the organization of the party improved since 19 no. to 20 no. there's no organization even today and it is a big surprise how he could win 21 seats out of 21 but you know personally i'm very very curious to uh, you know understand what what is this obsession you know or this pension that uh, mr kalyan has um, for quoting people and then quoting thinkers uh, usually out of context and his desire to be perceived as an intellectual right i mean the rumors going around that he's read two lakh books and so on and so forth uh, you know for instance yesterday he out of context quoted uh, national poet uh, ramdhari singh dinkar uh, right. So that is a case in point. I don't know if you've seen the speech. Uh, so what what is his obsession with being, uh, you know, seen as an intellectual? <laughs> He's wooing the BJP top brass like he woos a girl. Uh, so it's all attempt to impress the Hindi speaking people. I introduce him to Dinkar. I introduced him to Sonlal Dvivedi. I introduced him to Sh Maitri Sharan Gupta, to Surikant Party Nirala, um, and their poetry. I know that. Uh, I, I must say, at this, um, at this juncture, it, it is relevant that we were friends, uh, me and him, and uh, not political colleagues as much as friends we were. Yeah, he likes he likes books. He likes intellect. He, he likes to be with intellectual people. And he is not uh, entirely unintellectual. He appears that way. He's an intelligent, smart guy. What is this obsession with you know this aura that is created that uh, he 
wants to be seen as an intellectual. He wants to be seen as somebody who's read so many things, who can quote so many people. He talks about Robert Solo once, and then he's talking about Che Guevara. Then uh, he's talking about Dinkar, and then suddenly he goes back to the Puranas, and you know he's everywhere. Right. So why is it that in every performance or every speech that he gives, there is this obsession to show that he is a very, very well-read guy? Being intelligent is something else, right? Okay. But to, to be to or to show that I am a very well-read person is something else. So let's take a hypothetical situation, right? Now, Mr. Pawan Kalyan is going all out with Hindutva rhetoric or the ideological rhetoric of the BJP. Primarily because right now he is in alliance with them, and like you mentioned earlier, because of political opportunism. How do you think the TDP, which has started this allegation, how is the TDP going to react if Pawan Kalyan is going to escalate this further? Yeah, Pawan Kalyan is a maverick, a wild horse. Okay, um, he he cannot be reined in. He won't be reined in. So he will say, say, give me death or give me my freedom or th things like that. So he won't listen. But right now, it looks like in Andhra Pradesh, there are two chief ministers. One is Chandrababu Naidu. The other is Pawan Kalyan. Even if Pawan Kalyan's chief ministership, deputy chief ministership is merely an ornamental position, uh, like the vice captain, but they have created that position and they have created a monster by creating that position. All dictatorial people, all authoritarian people, one must be very careful with them. Never give them power because they will never leave it once they occupy seats of power. They are going to pervert the entire process in such a manner that they will never get off the pedestal once they sit in power. This is the book. Uh, this is a method of Stalin. This is a method of Hitler. This is a method of Mussolini uh, or Fidel Castro. Everywhere you see they come to power, they'll never leave it. So you give an authoritarian person charge of something, they'll never let it go. From the TDP's point of view, if Pawan Kalyan does escalate it, it's basically playing into the hands of the BJP, right? And why would the P TDP allow that? Yes, on on the on in public, they will align with uh, or they will cover up uh, Pawan Kalyan's activities because they are in an alliance. Okay, but privately, they'll be boiling because. The chief minister of Andhra Pradesh legitimately elected chief minister who secured 45% of the vote. Whereas Pawan Kalyan secured 6.8% of the vote. How can that man trump 45% of the vote? The man who secured that is a seasoned leader, a man who has done great things in the past. And he's now not even looking like the chief minister. It appears like Pawan Kalyan is the chief minister. He's stealing the thunder, you see. Uh, but... Um, that will be privately discussed at the moment and uh, it's only four months into their government, this coalition. They have to survive 60, 60 months and by about one year or one and a half years more, the fight or the feud between uh, Pawan Kalyan and Chandrababu Naidu will come to the fore. So you're saying because it will reach a point as the escalation? Uh, yes, it will come to the fore. Uh, because Pawan Kalyan has to play second fiddle, but he will he will do that very cleverly. I know him. He will do it very cleverly. But so also Chandrababu Naidu, though I don't know him personally, Chandrababu Naidu is a very seasoned politician and he's not a communal guy. He's not a communal uh, politician. So there's going to be a... Uh, thing. And moreover, there will be public consternation, you know, public anger, backlash. And that will that is already seen. In, uh, in four months. Imagine, how will they survive? He has a problem with both, uh, which is again very, very uh, you know, interesting. And then he's attacking progressives and you know he's talking about the Pune pact. He's just going back into history. He's talking about Adi Shankaracharya. One listens to it and then one, one's head starts spinning after a point, right? Uh, so naturally the question is, what have we voted for and what are we getting? right? <laughs> At the end of the day, uh, so how 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 is this a sustainable way of looking at it? The thing is that, um, incidentally, you share the same name, Pawan. And the thing is that he has absolutely no fidelity to any kind of um, ideological moors or moorings 
that tie him down to a narrow path where he's supposed to do his duty. He is a whimsical person, will do whatever he wants. And if you want, you stop me. Or else a man who makes speeches like that, uh, after being an elected representative, how is it that he is still uh, able to do that? Uh, so, number one, we are a very tolerant society. The, the Hindu society is an extremely giving and tolerant society. So they accept uh, even uh, this kind of things. Yeah, that's, that's precisely where I'm getting at, right? Now, this is not the first time that Mr. Kalyan has come out and done a protest like this, right? He's, he's earlier in the past as well, he's made allegations that there have been uh, desecrations of temple that happened during uh, Jagan Mohan Reddy's regime. He said there's rampant religious conversion to Christianity. He's made claims that about 33,000 odd women have been trafficked by village volunteers and so on and so forth. Right? And he's also declared earlier that he is a protector of Sanatan Dharma, that he himself is a Sanatani. Now, my question is that if he starts escalating and because the BJP does not have any base, like you said in Andhra, Pawan Kalyan making all these allegations when he's in power is one thing. But once the alliance breaks, because the TDP is not going to be comfortable, what purchase or what value would his theatrics or his protests have? And what is it going to get him in at least Andhra? Because out of the alliance, Pawan Kalyan seems to be nothing, right? He's got about 6% votes, probably a few seats, if not 21. And their biggest alliance partner, the BJP, is also not a big player. So does Pawan Kalyan have any ambitions outside Andhra post this breakup of this alliance in the state? Is he eyeing to be another next Yogi Adityanath, uh, you know, join the BJP or, you know, some people are saying he might as well merge his party with the BJP and go national. Uh, no, uh, it's definitely not the last one. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, people will see through him very easily. So that's number one, that he will not survive. Uh, he will have to keep on having a continuous series of new beginnings because he's only good at beginnings, he never finishes anything. So there is no comprehensiveness towards his political activity, nor in his personal life, actually. So, so he will keep on beginning new things. Uh, so Aram Bushur, he will begin something, and then he will lose uh, steam, and then begin something else, begin something else. So there will be many bursts of energy, uh, which look very nice, with great promise and all that, but they will fizzle out. So that's what will happen. He's not somebody who will um, ensure that the project is completed. There is no, he will just make uh, some noise here, some noise there. That's all. Uh, the reason I asked this is because he keeps talking, yesterday also he was talking uh, in English, he was talking in Hindi, right? And of course, he was talking also in Telugu whenever necessary, right? So clearly, it seems like he's got a larger audience in mind when he's doing that. Yeah. So hence, I ask you if he has any national ambitions. Uh, there is no end to ambition of an individual, who knows whether he has or not. Uh, and that is also not a moot point at this, at this, he's still a player in Andhra politics with 21 seats. So that's the thing. But um, uh, he, he's uh, definitely not uh, uh, going to sustain this if he, if he continues this way. But then if he has the uh, 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 if he has uh, support from the center, then people in Andhra will be kind of, uh, can be bullied with it. And uh, he will, he can go on bullying, saying that I know uh, the prime minister and uh, he will support me and uh, prime minister is uh, going to be with me. And so you will have to do what I say. So uh, he's going to just play that kind of a schoolyard bully politics. That's all. And uh, you mentioned about the 30,000 girls who he said were kidnapped by YSRCP uh, people. And now he doesn't talk about it. So that's what, that was one more beginning and all that. So he just his credibility is at a very, very uh, low point. But he's a weapon in the hands of someone else. He will come back more strongly to get their attention. You know, 
So ignoring him is the best punishment that TDP and YSRCB can give. And that's the best way to deal with him. Ignore him. But if they don't ignore him, if they keep continuing, they continuously give him media space, then he gains life with it. He should be ignored. That's the best way to deal with him. And not only politically, but good for society. Or else if he even succeeds 1% or 2% of what he's attempting to divide society based on religion, right now religion, who knows what else he will come up with. Uh, even if he succeeds to a very minuscule scale, it will still be damaging to our society. So ignore him. That's what I would say. That's the best way to treat him. To sum up, uh, you're telling us that there is a method behind the madness of this maverick called Pavan Kalyan. You Absolutely. Have also Deliberate method. I'm sorry. And you've also told us that there is apparently no ideology per se, but simply an ideology to gain power, just like most politicians are. Uh, and most importantly, you also say that there's no end to Mr. Paman Kalyan's aspiration, that so long as he has this urge to be in the eye of the storm, to be the sinosure of all attention, he will go to whatever extent that is necessary to stay relevant. All right. Thank you so much for speaking with The Wire. Mr. Raju Ravitej. Yeah, thank you so much, Paul.